might get started. Um, so what is Flex to start with? Well, it's a free piece of software developed by um, SIL. It runs on Windows and Linux. It doesn't run on Mac, unfortunately, so you need to use a Windows emulator to be able to use it on Windows. Um, the, the download link to the latest stable version from early last year is there. Um, and essentially it's a tool that's designed for the creation of a lexicon and interlinear glossing of texts with reference to that lexicon. It has actually a huge range of other functionalities as well. Um, and we won't be able to get into all of those today, but it is designed with various different kinds of users in mind. Um, and it's structured as a relational database and it's stored as XML under the hood. So all the data that is um, input into Flex into your database um, is very carefully structured and is, is all linked um, in specific ways. And you'll see how this plays out um, as we start to look at it. Um, there's quite a lot of training material online, so there's a few links there that you can check out, some of which include movies which are quite useful for stepping through things um, because it's not always easy or intuitive to work out where things are in certain menus or how you go about doing something. Um, but the actual help menu within Flex itself is really good, so you can just go to um, help and then there's various resources, including one that's an introduction to lexicography, which is quite useful for understanding how um, the sort of concept of lexicography that Flex is organized around. So when you're trying to work out how you're supposed to do something or where you're meant to find something, that can be quite useful background information. Um, and there's also a Flex Google group that can help with issues that you encounter. I thought that Google groups were actually um, being sort of all deleted, but this one seems to still be functional and active and you'll find a lot of people running into very specific problems and the developers of Flex are often on there and very quickly helping to troubleshoot or um, fix bugs. So that's a really useful resource as well. Um, okay. <clears throat> so we're going to step through a few different things, but essentially starting from setting up a Flex database from scratch. Um, and so here's where I'll skip out of the slides and I'll just be working from Flex. But again, the notes and the slides that are in that download link have got all of this information in them. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we're going to do is go to uh, wherever Flex has been downloaded. If you've got a shortcut on your desktop or you've got it in the start menu, I'm going to open that. Perhaps a bit slow. And then what you get is a little menu that says, okay, do you want to open a project or create a new project, um, restore a project from a backup file? So what we want to do is create a new project here, but something I just want to flag is that it has this option here of when I start Language Explorer, always open the last edited project automatically. Think carefully about whether you want that because it gets quite tricky if you have different versions of a database floating around. If whenever you click on Flex, it's opening whatever last one you had open, it's gonna be really hard to keep track of what you're working in. So I recommend not ticking that and always opening directly exactly what um, file or database you, you know you're currently working on. But for now, we're gonna to go to create a new project. Uh, we're going to name the project. So the sample data we're working on is uh, from a language called Lapit. It's an Eastern Nilotic language of South Sudan. So I'm just going to call the project Lapit. And then one thing we have to do early on and can look at in more detail later is um, set up writing systems. So this is something that's actually quite important within Flex. It determines a lot about what can go in particular fields um, and, and how they relate to one another. So the vernacular language writing system is essentially what's the language that you're making a database of or what's the language that you're analysing. And so for some reason it automatically comes up with French. Uh, we want to go to define new. And because I've named the project Lapit, it's guessing that I might be working on Lapit. Um, and so I can actually select that name there and it's got the ethnologue code um, and click OK. And, and it just thinks for a minute. Now, there's various stuff that you can customize here in terms of the font. Uh, well, I've already got Lapit set up here, so it doesn't want me to change it. Um, the keyboard sorting of um, alphabetic characters, what characters are permitted and not permitted, all that kind of stuff. So this is kind of endlessly customizable. You can look at it all later as well. So we're just gonna click cancel because in fact, I've already got Lapit in 
my own list here. Um, and then the analysis language is essentially what your glosses or translations definitions will be in at least now. Um, and again, this can be whatever you want. I'm going to make it English for myself, but you can also have multiple analysis languages. Um, uh, so if you wanted to have definitions both in Lapit and English, that's totally fine. You, but you can set all of that up in more detail after. So we've got Lapit, we've got English, okay. Now it's going to come up with a pop-up that says, do you want all these anthropology categories? It doesn't really matter too much what you choose right now if you're not sort of interested in those topics. Um, but I'm just going to click OK and include all of that in the database as well. <clears throat> now it's going to create my project. Um, and so for more information about the writing systems, if you go to help resources and technical notes on writing systems, that's where you can find um, all of this information. It is quite complex, so it's good to have a look at that and probably a little bit of trial and error in getting it right for a new project. Um, okay, so once your new project's created, it gets automatically saved to a default location. You can find this under file, project management, and then project locations and sharing. So it'll be something like program data, SIL, fieldworks, projects. Um, and the important thing to note is that the sort of file to open if you're working on a new project will be this .fw data file. Um, so if I have it open here, it's now created a folder called Lapit with my project and the folder has a whole bunch of stuff in it which is kind of configuration settings and extra information about the database. The project database itself is this .fw data file. So if you are opening your database to work on it, it's that file that you want. Okay, back to Flex. Um, all right. So we're going to just step through how to enter new lexical items, assuming that we're starting from scratch, going to make a new dictionary. Um, and so we might want to um, first work out what we're actually looking at here. So we've got different tabs down the bottom here, lexicon, text and words, grammar. By default, we'll be in this lexicon pane here. And then there's different um, options here as well. So by default, we'll be in the lexicon edit pane. We'll come to some of these other ones later. But if you get a bit lost working out what you're looking at in Flex, it's probably because you've moved around between these or between these up here. So um, if we just want to add a new word, we can go insert entry. And then also this plus sign here will do the same. So insert entry and gives us a very basic screen here to enter some data. Um, we'll enter a couple of Lapit words here um, and just some basic things, the lexeme form. So I'm going to type H-I-M-O, which is the word for nose. So for gloss, I'm going to put nose. Um, and then category is a grammatical category. I'm just going to select noun from this drop down menu. Of course, this can be customized and there's a lot more detail that can be added in there to the, to the options as well. That's a good start. So I'm going to create that. I'm going to create another new word. Lexeme form is M-E-S-I, which is plural. So I'm going to gloss that as noses. And I'm also going to put that as a noun. So at this point, just worth noting that in Lapit, the number marking is really irregular. So in the database, the actual database that I have for Lapit, we have separately entered all of the singular and plural forms because it's important to, um, to track what they are. It's not predictable. Um, so, uh, but that might be something that's not useful for whatever language you might be working on. So we've got two words in our database now. Um, Himo for nose and Mercy for noses. Now, if we want to add a little bit more detail here, uh, we pretty much do that through everything here on the right hand side. So um, maybe, for example, we want, okay, we've got these both as noun because that was just in our short list of drop down options in that initial pane. Maybe we want to add something a bit more specific here and be able to distinguish singular from plural nouns here. So the way that we do that is we go to uh, grammar mode here. So in these panes down on the bottom left, we go to grammar mode. And then at the top, it's got this section category edit. So we can add all sorts of stuff in here. So if we um, uh, click on noun here so that it's highlighted, and then we go to insert subcategory, and then we click category I need is not shown, create a custom category. 
uh, we can put in some subcategories of nouns. So we might want to say noun plural and give it an abbreviation, which is what would be used in an actual sort of dictionary view. And then maybe we want to add another subcategory, which we're going to call, whoops, I've added that as a subcategory of the other one. Go back to noun, insert subcategory. Noun singular with an abbreviation. And then we've got two subcategories here. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, then we want to go back to the lexicon mode here. So again, on the bottom left, going back to that pane. And then on the right hand side here, we've got extra information that we can add. And here, this one grammatical info that has noun that we previously selected. But now if I click on that, the drop down list includes these custom categories that I've added. So I can say, okay, hang on, this is the singular. And then for the other one that we glossed as noses, I can go to that drop down and say, okay, oops, sorry, this is the plural. Okay, so now we've already started to customize some of our grammatical categories here. And of course, this is gonna completely depend on the sort of language you're working on and, and the level of analysis that you've undertaken so far. So on the right here, there's a few basic fields showing up, um, but this box on the very top right here where it says show hidden fields, if I tick that, there's a whole lot of other stuff that comes up that we that helps us to add extra information to individual items in the database. And you know, this is really anticipating lots of potential stuff that people may not want to put in and a lot of it may not be necessary for your particular project or use case, but it is um, very useful that it's all there. Um, and of course, you can you can add custom categories um, here as well, although this does cover sort of many things that you might need. Um, one pro tip, so for anyone who's used to working in toolbox or who's used to the kind of backslash codes that are in structured um, text files with dictionary data, if you click and drag along here so that your um, the names for all these different fields are reduced, then you actually start to get, for any fields that do correspond to a backslash code, you'll get that displayed. So the lexeme will have LX here. Um, and this is quite useful to know if you're importing data that has been originally stored in a toolbox format, because you'll know what can be mapped to what. So we've got a few here, LX um, or PS for part of speech. Not all of them correspond directly, but that's just quite a useful trick to know what matches. Um, okay. Um, okay, so if you talked about writing systems being something that's really important, you'll see that some of these writing systems have got a little um, superscript LOP for LAPIT as the vernacular writing system or ENG for English as the analysis writing system. And so this limits what can be put in these fields. Um, and so by default, it's assuming that the lexeme form or the citation form are going to be in LAPIT and then our gloss or definition is going to be in English because we've specified that. But you can add multiple writing systems to a particular field. So if I click on, for example, um, if I've clicked in the box for definition where I might enter a definition, um, uh, we can, so just checking where I'm up to, um, we can click on the drop down arrow here, writing systems and configure, and we can change. Maybe we want to also have the definitions in Lapit or another language. In this case, it might be Juba Arabic, which is a, the Creole of South Sudan that people know. It depends on, again, what your use case is, what the eventual output might be, if it's gonna be a dictionary that's multilingual, um, all of those kinds of things. Um, okay. Um, what else? Okay, so the writing systems, um, ah, yes, or perhaps if you wanted to use a keyboard that has a phonetic font for this pronunciation field here, which I'll come back to in just a second. Um, okay, a few other key fields. So the citation form that I mentioned before is really useful because sometimes for purposes of making a dictionary, you want to separate the, the citation form, the form that people might um, use most likely 
use to look up an entry um, from the Lexeme form, which is what you're going to be using for glossing. So this might be something that's more like a STEM or, um, you know, some kind of base form. It really, again, depends on the language and, and the analyses that you're doing. Um, but the citation form can be separate from the Lexeme form. So if the citation form is empty, it will just use the Lexeme form as the header. Um, and so this is the headword column on the left hand side here. So if I was to change citation form to, um, I don't know, something with a double E, which is not accurate, then it would change the headword form here. But we're going to leave it empty for now. Um, definition. So if the definition field is empty, Flex will automatically use what's in the gloss. Um, so I'll just go back to the singular here. Um, so definition fields empty, Flex will automatically use the gloss nose in this little, uh, see this dictionary preview here in the top right. But if a definition is entered, then it will use that instead. So if we had something longer, um, uh, so I can add something in here. What have I put? So I'll add um, protrusion, protrusion on the face for drawing in air. And then you'll see that up here now in the dictionary preview, it's using that longer definition rather than the gloss. So it just depends what's available and it will default to the gloss if there's nothing else to draw on. Um, uh, pronunciation field. So for me, I'm, most of my research is in phonetics and phonology. And so this is a field that I've used a lot, partly because um, when I first started using Flex, it was essentially as a lexical database so that I could um, construct a lexicon for a language and then be able to really effectively sort and filter that to do different analyses, but also to construct experimental materials for phonetic analysis. So in the pronunciation field here, it's one of various fields in Flex where um, once you start typing in it, other options show up. So if I start typing in here, it actually comes up with other options for a CV pattern or tone, um, location um, and things like that. So the pronunciation, I'm going to type um, X I M O because it's actually a, a velar fricative here. And again, you could put whatever it can have tone diacritics. It should, this is a, a tonal language, but this is kind of a simplified data set just for our purposes today. Uh, and then once it's got something in there, notice it'll also by default show that up in square brackets in this little dictionary preview. Um, and so if you want to be able to specially uh, to separate um, the pronunciation from the orthographic form in your dictionary, um, very useful for having there. Um, and then you can add other information there as well. Um, I'm going to add something to the plural as well, just to have something in that field, but it's just going to be the same as the orthography here. So I've got something in square brackets there for pronunciation for noses and for nose. Um, okay. So, um, and of course, some of these fields can be uh, edited. We won't have time to go into it today, but can be edited using bulk edit entries on the left here. So for example, I could um, automatically populate the field for CV pattern by copying in everything in the pronunciation and then replacing every consonant character with a C and every vowel character with a V, which would be quite useful if I was doing analyses of phonotactics or syllable structure that kind of thing. So you can do some nifty stuff like that uh, with caution when you sort of have an idea of what you're doing. Um, okay, so the location field here is kind of an interesting one. Um, so I've used this to specify dialect labels um, in the project I've been working on. So Lapit, the language has got six dialects and so we've um, kept the forms different in the lexicon. And in fact, it doesn't show very well on my screen because I've got the zoom overlaid on top. Um, but just on the far right hand side, if I've clicked in this box for location, it comes up with a little box with three dots in it, which shows me that this is a field that has, um, instead of accepting free text, it needs you to choose options from a list. So if I click on that, I get a list that says choose location, but I haven't added any locations. So these are all empty. So I'm going to have to go to edit the locations list. And so again, now this has taken us to this lists pane. So down in the bottom left here, you can see where we've um, ended up. And then one of the list options is locations. There's nothing in here. Um, but if I want to add something, let's go insert location. I'm going to insert a location name called uh, Doric, which is the main dialect um, of Lapit. And um, 
maybe we'll give it an abbreviation, DRK. So we've got one here. And then if we go to insert another location, we'll put one that's Nabori, which is a slightly further north and an abbreviation as well. So, oops. <clears throat> so we've got two locations specified here now to choose from. So if I were to go back to the lexicon, go to our entry for nose, got here in the location field, get that list up again by clicking on the box with three dots. Now I've got some uh, location labels to choose from. I can say, okay, this is the form in the, the Doric dialect. And then also for noses, may as well do the same. Click in this location field, brings up those three dots. Let's say that's also the Doric dialect. So then that's showing up in our little dictionary preview here in the top right, that, which is totally customizable, but it's quite useful to know um, this information, even just as you're working with the database um, and keeping track of things. Okay, um, some of the other main fields that are useful to know. Um, one is reversals. So back in this lexicon tab here. So reversals is what you might use if you're looking up an entry in an index or a finder list. Um, and you can have multiple entries in here. So in the reversals tab, um, which is directly underneath the gloss. In this case, we might put, um, well, nose. Um, and then if I hit enter, this is probably quite, it's hard to see on my screen, it's probably harder on yours. If I hit enter, it'll put a little gray line in between and then I can click after and put a separate um, reversal. So if I was to look up the word, if I wanted to look up nose or snout, I would be pointed towards this entry hemo in both cases, which in La Pit, could mean a human nose or an animal snout or nose. Um, and then for noses in the plural, if I want to be able to find both the singular and plural forms with the same reversals, same thing, I can type nose, hit enter. It's got a little gray line in the middle there. And then I can enter snout as well. Um, then, um, yes, okay, so then, I'll probably get back to this a little bit in a bit, but then I can see the reversals under reversal indexes here. So we're still in the lexicon pane, but on the left-hand side here, this reversal indexes. And it's got nose, okay, it points me towards the singular and plural and also snout towards the singular and plural. So you can imagine how this whole list can eventually be um, populated. So I'm gonna go back to lexicon edit again. <clears throat> Okay, um, so reversals, we've got that. Okay, semantic domains is an interesting one. Um, so again, depending on what your use case is or to what extent you're trying to keep track of the kind of coverage that you have in terms of the types of lexical entries in your database, um, some people quite like to use this or also as a way of collecting data in the, in the first place. Um, so Flex comes with a, a large set of semantic domains included, which is essentially categorizations of things into types. So whether they're to do with the body or the natural world or um, the sky or, you know, and it, can, it gets quite granular. Um, and if I want to add uh, information about a semantic domain, so I'll go back to our singular entry here, um, then I can find that, um, on the right hand side here. So it's with the senses. Here we go. So semantic domains, this field here. So again, because I've got show hidden fields ticked, it's got all the other stuff showing as well. So it's a bit of scrolling around. Um, but semantic domains, if I click here, um, it's I think one of the fields is the little box with three dots, which shows me it's about choosing from a list. Also, if I know the semantic domains or I have a guess about them, I can just start typing and it will populate them. So if I start typing um, head, for example, it comes up with the categorization um, head. Uh, occasionally Flex has this little bug where you select an entry from a list and it flips um, to a different screen. So apologies if that happens occasionally. So I've put head for that and I'm gonna go to the plural do the same, go down and find semantic domains. And if I start typing head, it's gonna come up with it and it's also gonna change my screen. Um, and let's see, we can add as many as we want. So we might also want to add um, 
you know, make sure that the, the entry for nose is linked to any words to do with breathing, perhaps. Um, and the whole list can be seen by clicking on this thing with three dots and see it's already got head and breathe selected, but there's all of the main categories, subcategories, everything like that. So not necessarily something that everyone's going to want to use, but has been useful in some of the people that I've worked with in identifying gaps in the lexicon and, and things that we need to target for collecting data. Um, a couple of other fields that I find quite useful and a lot of people will is um, also bibliography and source fields. Um, so in the each entry, there's a field here called bibliography. This is at the entry level where you might put, for example, if you have a reference to maybe the, an audio recording where you first um, encountered this word or had a detailed discussion about the semantics of this word. Um, so Nick was talking about file naming and archiving. This might be where you put some information about that. Um, and there's also a separate bibliography field with individual senses. So you kind of have the kind of main information that goes with a lexical item, and then you can have different senses of it if there are different meanings that are associated with that word, and perhaps you have different references for those. And then source is a separate field. And the, you know, these can be used how you want. I've seen some projects where people have used, um, especially in a kind of language revitalization context where people have used the bibliography field for written sources, if it's come from some kind of word list or book or grammatical description, um, whereas source has been used for um, spoken references. So, you know, this particular elder knew this word or this person reported um, the meaning of this word as this. And so that might depend a little bit on your, on your usage, but very good to track, um, I think, where words have come from if you're working on a documentation project, especially if it's something with multiple people, because it can get um, tricky to remember where you first encountered something um, uh, or had that discussion about what it really means. Um, lots of other fields that might be useful for your purposes. So example can be where you put example sentences. Um, there's also a scientific name just below that. So if you're looking at plant or animal species, um, the, um, what else? Oh, etymology um, is here as well. Another one of those fields where if you start typing, it comes up with lots of different options. So once I put that in there, there's, uh, I can put something about the source language or the source form, also a separate gloss or a bibliographic source, um, if that's useful. So if you're working more on a historical um, uh, project, for example, um, or you're putting proto forms and you want to record them in your dictionary, um, uh, and lots of other fields there that will sort of take a little bit of exploring. Um, okay, and you can also add custom fields. Um, so if you go to tools, configure and custom fields here, you can um, add all sorts of things in here. Don't recommend it unless you really need to, because once you do have custom fields, it can be hard to um, organize them with a dictionary display. So on the right hand side, you can see there's kind of these, these thick lines that separate content and these fields um, all this stuff on the right hand side is kind of organized in groups and then when you want to display it in a dictionary you can only sort of move things around within their groups and not outside their groups um, and so custom fields it can be hard to kind of smoosh that into the right place in terms of how you display your your data um, uh, but it can be quite useful if you're doing certain kinds of analysis in your lexical database. So I mentioned that for Lapit the number marking is really irregular so we had some custom fields that specified what the particular number marking morpheme was for different singular and plural nouns and then having that and being able to sort and filter it and look at certain correlations allowed us to move forward with an analysis of some tendencies there even though it's not um, predictable what happens. So there might be specific use cases where custom fields are, are quite handy. Um, okay and so now we've got We've added data in some extra fields. So we put in some reversal entries here and we also added some semantic domains. We're not seeing these here in the left hand side. So we want to add some extra columns so that the data that we really want to be looking at or the information we really want to be looking at is actually displaying. So to do that, I'm going to go to tools, configure uh, columns. And then I have to find, first I'll look for our reversal um, indexes. So this is reversals add it to the right hand side and then semantic domains as well, add it to the right hand side. And then if I click okay, we've got our other two columns here, reversals 
semantic domains. Um, so just in terms of working with the data, it's useful to know what you do want to be looking at and what you don't, um, because otherwise it can get a lot of information in front of you that you don't necessarily need all the time. Okay, so this is another use case where maybe you're not entering data from scratch, but instead perhaps you have um, some kind of text file, um, perhaps something that's originated from toolbox where you've had some kind of lexicon for a language and you want to be able to import it in Flex to start, um, you know, enriching it there, um, making it more consistent, moving towards some kind of output for it. Um, and so, Flex can import a, a standard lexicon, uh, standard format lexicon file. So if you go to file and import here, it's this standard format lexicon, which is output by, by various programs. Um, if this were a fully fledged database already, I would strongly recommend that you do a backup before you make any significant changes like importing something, especially if there's the potential for you to have duplicate entries or um, if it's data that's come from someone else and you don't know how consistent or messy it might be. We don't need to worry about that at this point, but definitely do backups before you make any major changes to your database. Um, but I'm just going to go next for now. And so the file that I'm going to import is a little set of sample data that I've already prepared. And so if you're um, trying this now or later, it's um, in that folder that I linked you to, um, the file that ends with .db. So I've already got it there showing up, but I'll just show you uh, where it is. So on my desktop, it's this one that's called lpximport.db. So I'm going to open that. Um, it's automatically creating some settings files, which you don't need to worry about for now. I'm going to go next. Um, in the So this, this can be quite tricky, this import process, and really a lot of it hinges on how organised this text data is in the first place, and especially if it's something that's come out of Toolbox. Um, I've you know helped a lot of people with conversion from Toolbox to Flex, and sometimes uh, it's you know an extremely organised database, and it's not too hard. But sometimes it's um, lots of sort of idiosyncratic or inconsistent conventions that are being used, and in that case, it's a lot better to try and clean it up as much as possible in the text file um, before trying to import in Flex if you can. So using regular expressions or something like that, because um, there is a little bit of um, mucking around to get the mapping right potentially, and it's going to be a lot harder if your underlying textual data is um, is messy or, or inconsistent. Um, so I've intentionally put a couple of things in here that we need to fix just so I can show you how to do that because it's a little bit tricky to work out. Um, but there are, if you go to um, uh, help resources and there's a, a document called technical notes on SFM database input, uh, import, sorry. Um, it really steps through how to do this and it has a lot of detail about how um, different backslash codes map to the fields in Flex. So this is really useful for knowing if you are going to attempt a kind of major import um, for a, a set of data that's come out of toolbox or something. Um, okay, so, um, um, all right. Da, 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 da. Okay, so I'm going to click next on the language mapping um, because it's already picked that the vernacular must be in Lapit and the English, um, the analysis language is in English. It's just assumed that because that's what I've specified for this database already. Um, but I could modify it if I wanted to. So I'm going to go next. Now, when we get to content mapping, it's got some bits that show up in red, which shows that there's something that I need to fix. So um, in my database, it's got something corresponding to pronunciation, but Flex doesn't know what language that's supposed to be in. So it's just showing up as red and saying unknown. So I need to fix that. Um, so I'm going to click on that row. I'm going to select modify. And then where it has language descriptor, I need to pick vernacular. Um, and that's all I need to do here. I can just click OK and then that field is no longer read. Flex knows how to handle it. <clears throat> um, and then we have another field that's read. It doesn't know what to do with this field PLO. Um, this is actually a pronunciation location field. Um, so I need to, again, modify that. So I click on it, I go to modify um, and it's, got this box ticked default import residue auto, which means it doesn't know what to do with it. And it's going to kind of just chuck it as a residual piece of data when it imports. I don't really want that. I want it to actually do something useful with it. I want to map it to the location field that I already showed you in flex. So I'm going to untick that. Um, 
And then I have to go down the list here until I find pronunciation location, um, which is under pronunciation, pronunciation location. And then um, that's fine. And then I want to change the language descriptor here to, to English, which is our analysis language, or if I had an IPA keyboard specified, um, it might show up there. Um, and then I'm going to click OK. And now that's fine too. It doesn't show up in red anymore. It knows how to handle it. So it's this kind of mapping, making sure that Flex knows what to do with the data that you're importing. So I'm going to go next. Um, key markers is information about how things are grouped together. We don't need to worry about it at this stage, but um, if you have a textual um, database that's got a lot of, maybe it's got multiple glosses on multiple definitions per entry, um, you might need to think about how you group those here so that um, document te technical notes on um, importing will be helpful in working out what to do here, but we're just going to click next character mapping, we can click next. Um, and then before it imports everything, it'll generate a report and it'll open it in the web, web browser. So you have to click that. Um, it basically just says, okay, here's, here's all the data um, and you know everything was fine. But if anything had an error, it didn't know what to do with it, it would tell us here. Okay, then we go next and then we go finish and it will display a final report as well, which is just gonna be the same. It's got a bit more detail down the bottom. Um, you can have a look at that in your own time. Now we've got a whole lot of other entries here in our lexical database. Um, okay, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about searching, sorting and filtering, um, but I'll just very quickly show you that essentially it's up the top here. You can, uh, whoop doing that thing where it flips between screens. So if you just click, it'll change the alphabetical sorting. If you just click in the, um, the column header, so head word or gloss or whatever, it'll change whether that's alphabetized. You can click on the drop down arrows to just show everything that's blank or um, show all or filter for is search. So if I just wanted to type something there, I can find it. Um, or if I wanted to use regular expressions, so if you're doing more complex searches, you can tick that. And then there's a little arrow here on the right of the text box where it actually gives you some of the information about um, the regular expression um, operators. So if you don't know regular expressions, you can start playing around with some of those and you can also click on regular expression help um, to find out more about that. So searching and filtering, uh, very useful for just working with the data. Um, and then also very useful if you're doing any bulk editing. Um, and so if I go to bulk edit entries here, I might want to filter for everything. I'm just going to do this a bit quickly. I'm going to first add the reversals column going to filter for anything that's blank. Okay, so all of these entries here, which are all morphemes of various sorts, don't have um, a glot, don't have a reversal um, entry. So perhaps I want to say, okay, let's do bulk copy down the bottom left here, take whatever's in the gloss field, put it in the reversals field. Let's have a little preview of that before we do it. That looks fine click apply. So you can do this kind of bulk editing to fill in gaps in your lexicon. Um, again, recommend making a backup before you make any big changes. Um, and that's my next point, how to make backups. So that very easy, you just go to file, um, file project management, backup this project. And if I click that, what it'll do is create um, in this folder by default, but you can obviously select where it goes. It'll create a file that's a .fw backup file. And so if you are sending your database to someone else or you're just making backups along the way, that's what you want, that .fw backup file um, in which you can bundle the configuration settings or if you've got images in there, that kind of stuff. Okay, so we'll leave it at that. Um, okay, I wanna talk a little bit about glossing and texts. Um, so what we'll do is maybe have a quick look at how to enter things in from scratch, but a couple of points. So it is now possible to, um, if you're working in Elan, 
you can export transcribed texts as a dot flex text file um, you can import these into flex and do your glossing and then export a flex text file again and take it back into a lan but your LAN file needs to be set up in a very, very specific way. Um, and so in the slides and in the document there, there's a link to um, an instructional set of materials about how to do this. Um, it's hard to provide a template that's going to work for everyone because it's really going to depend a lot on what the data is. So does it have one participant or two? Um, you know, what's the language information, all that kind of stuff. So it's a little bit of trial and error in setting it up to work for you but you can set up a template that you can use um, and if you already have a lot of LAN data transcribed then this might be a little bit frustrating because you'll have to kind of rejig um, the tiers and tier names and things in order to be able to get them into flex and then back out again but if you did want to do that you can go file uh, so we have to be in the text and words pane so down on the bottom left text and words and then it will be file um, import um, flex text into linear so that's if you're importing something that you've already exported from LAN. Um, but just to have a quick look at glossing, we'll just start with some just text entry directly into here. Um, and so in the materials that I gave you, there's a little text file, which is text-a-copy.txt. So if you want, you can just open that up when you're having a go later or if you're following along now, copy that text. We're here in this baseline field automatically. I'm gonna paste that in. And I'm also gonna give this text a name. So I'm going to call it um, Ikuro Hohiwaru, which is uh, the squirrel and the leopard. So now it's going to show the text name on the left there. And if we had other texts, it would show up all their names there so we can work out what we've got. So I've just entered the raw text here in the baseline. But if I then click on the um, uh, Analyze tab next, we can see that Flex has already had a go at trying to gloss this based on what's in the dictionary and if there's no sort of real competing um, information. And so, but a whole lot have got asterisks, which means it doesn't know what to do with them. And generally this is because it doesn't know what the morpheme boundaries are. So this relates to the earlier question. So if I want to make sure that Flex can gloss it, I need to click in this second row where it says morphemes and then click on the drop down arrow next to the um, entry that appears and click edit morph breaks. Okay, and so I, it has got here, for example, um, for the question before where it was how to handle infixes, if there were hyphens either side, um, Flex would know to interpret this as an infix. In this case, we're looking at a prefix. So I'm gonna put a hyphen and then a space. So Flex knows this is a prefix and then some kind of stem that doesn't have any punctuation. So if I click okay on that, now, because these are in the lexical data that we already imported, Flex goes, great, now I know we've got this prefix and this is the stem, the verb to say. Everything that's highlighted in blue, it means Flex has had a guess at it, but I still need to check and approve it. So I can click in here and tick and say, yep, that's the word for people. Um, the next one, I again need to edit the morpheme break. So we've got a person marking prefix. I'll put that in with a space, knows how to handle it now. The next one's fine. Just going to move through these ones quickly. They're mostly fine. Tick, tick, tick. Um, if there are capitals, Flex sometimes has trouble. So in this case, um, the word is there, but because it has a capital, it hasn't automatically recognized it. So I just need to switch that and it does its little changing screen thing. And then also put the gloss, which is linked to that entry, but for some reason we need to specify them differently. Now it's got it. So this one's fine, fine 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 um, in this case oh, sorry this is that annoying little bug okay we've got a prefix um, and another prefix so I'll put two that's fine Again, this one has both a capital and a couple of morphemes in there. So I need to tell Flex a bit more about it. Edit morpheme breaks. So we've got a question marker and then a second person marker. Okay, so here we have a previous example where this um, E, this close vowel is a morpheme that um, 
uh, indicates perfective. In this case, I know um, that it's a second person marker, but they have the same form. So here I need to click on the drop down arrow and say, actually, it's not the perfective, it's the second singular prefix. Um, and I need to choose that and it will change it. So you need to keep checking along the way, of course, if you have morphemes that have the same form, which one's being used there. And if I've already been using this perfective, it's going to guess that first before the second person form here. Okay, that's fine. Um, just quickly finish this off because it helps with editing the last bit. Um, again, this H prefix here has the same form as another morpheme. So in this case, it's actually a sequential marker, not a question marker. Um, that's fine. Again, we've got the problem of capitals. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. And it kind of learns as you go um, what the morpheme breaks might be and what the most frequent forms are. Um, so, nearly done. This one has a suffix. I think I got that right. Okay. So I just wanted to enter all of those in so that you can see what it looks like when they're all fully glossed. And underneath, we can also enter translations as free text if we want. So in case you want them, I've included them in this other text file translation. So I'm just gonna paste them in. So we've got, so that you know what these um, sentences actually mean. <clears throat> Oops, missed it. Okay, it's kind of a horrific story where it starts out with these animals deciding they're going to go and eat their mothers. So we've got the analysis, we've got the free text here, that's all fine. Um, and now um, we've got fully glossed little section of a text. If I were to go back to the baseline and just add one more sentence, so I'm going to add one more Ojo. Um, uh, okay, so this means the leopard said to the squirrel, yes. So I've added another text in the baseline. Then I go back to analyze and you'll see because I've already um, been showing flex how I want these things to be glossed in terms of morphemes, it's made some better guesses now. And the only word that's missing is this one on the end. So I can just go tick. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Now, this word here is the word that means yes in Lapit. It's not in the lexicon. So what I need to do is say, click on this third line here, create new entry. Okay, I'm gonna take away the capitals there. I'm gonna put in the gloss. I'm not gonna worry about a part of speech for now. Create, and then that's added a gloss here. Um, but if I go back to the lexicon, and take off my filter, we can see it's also been added to the lexicon. So this is just to illustrate that everything that's in the glossing and interlinearization is directly linked to everything that's in the lexicon. So you can add things to the lexicon as you go through the glossing um, and as you're doing the glossing, it'll draw on whatever's already in the lexicon. So this is much easier to keep organized in terms of, um, of your data um, and your knowledge about the language as you go, because you can edit it on the fly regardless of which part of the database you're in. Um, okay, so that's the little sample of text and glossing. So I've just got about five minutes before the end of this, so I'll tell you a little bit about um, export possibilities. So in Flex, if you want to, um, if we're under lexicon mode here in the bottom left and we click on this tab that says dictionary here, it gives us a little preview of what the dictionary might look like. So it's, you know, it's got some alphabetization, which is just default because I haven't specified that and it's grouped um, the entries there. Um, this is fully customizable. So it's just under tools, configure dictionary, and there are heaps of options in terms of how things are grouped, what shows up, what doesn't whether it's italicized or bold or whatever, um, all that's customizable. 
um, a, a bit of mucking around maybe to work out what, what works for you. Um, the reversal indexes can also be configured in similar ways. So we're still in the lexicon pane, but now reversal indexes. So again, you can go tools, configure, reversal index, and there are, there are fewer options, but there are options. Um, so this might be if you're going for a sort of, you know, a dictionary followed by a finder list um, with English or whatever analysis language is the head words. Um, and then under, I'm going to go back to actually to lexicon edit. So if I just want to export some data, you can export stuff in all kinds of different formats. So I'm just looking at the lexical data for now. So under file export, uh, there's lots of different formats here. And if you have installed um, Pathway, which is a, a plugin, so there's a link, um, I think, yes, I put a link there in the notes and in the slides. Uh, you can install that first. And this is quite a nifty way to very quickly just export a PDF um, or um, something like that so that you can just show people. So if I just go export, and say, look, I just want a PDF. Um, it's got various styles. Uh, it, it wants you to put a name in before you can export it. You have to tick that you say you've complied um, with intellectual property policies, and then click OK. And this will just take a minute, but it should pop up very quickly. <clears throat> Perhaps. Yep, there we go. So, and here we have just a PDF uh, with, you know, whatever words we've got grouped under these different um, alphabetized headings. Um, and, you know, again, for a kind of final product, you probably want to do a lot more, um, you know, checking and formatting and, you know, perhaps going through open office or something else to do um, better formatting before your final product, but this is a really useful way of just getting something out quickly so you can show people what a draft looks like and get feedback. Um, and that's been quite useful, but you do need that pathway plugin installed first, which is linked to there. So that's exporting lexical data. Um, and note that when you are exporting, it will apply any particular filters that you have. So if you've filtered this to only show blanks or something like that, that's all that will get um, exported. Um, and then for um, exporting texts, um, we can go to back to our text and words pane, file, export into linear. And so if we'd been doing some work, we'd brought this in from Milan, we'd been doing some work in here for the interlinearization and then wanted to bring it back out to Elan, we go file export and then click this uh, flex text option and then export it as that. But again, there are lots of different export options depending on um, what you want to do with it or what sort of formatting you want to be um, working with. Um, and I think that's about it. So I'm... any other questions? It's good to, I, I didn't mention this before, but if you are planning on doing the Elan Flex Elan workflow, I really highly recommend trying it with one file first, trying to get your formatting right in Elan, do the import into Flex, do your interlinearization, export it back as a Flex text, um, and then import that again into Elan and see how it looks rather than doing a whole set of files and finding that there might be some errors or, or some data that's not preserved or has gone awry. So I really recommend trying it with one first because there's a bit of trial and error involved. Especially if you've already got a, a big set of Elan files that have been transcribed and formatted in a specific way that you've had to um, adjust for the purposes of getting them into Flex. Good to try one first. <laughs>